the narrative right now is that the the national elections that are happening on Thursday will be a disappointing set of elections for Labour. Now, Keir Starmer has been pretty clear when he's appeared on television. The fault is um, the ghost of Jeremy Corbyn, principally, he's saying he's bringing down the Labour vote, even in seats that Jeremy Corbyn won. And he's saying it's because the vaccine rollout was successful. That's the official story. But increasing numbers of people, both on the left and now some on the centre, are saying that failure, so the failure to do particularly well um, in those elections, if it happens, will have a different cause. And that's the lack of any clear vision for the party and any vision for the country. Um, so to start off this conversation, we're going to give you an example of uh, a Labour candidate really failing to express a vision for the country or the party. This is Paul Williams, the candidate for Hartlepool, who struggled to tell Owen Jones what Labour stood for. What is Labour's vision for the country now? What does Labour stand for? Don't say fairness and everything being nice and mother had an apple pie. What is it concretely? What is the vision? People in this election aren't talking, though, about... Oh, come Labour's, on, about vision. Labour's vision about, La about Labour's vision for the country. They're talking about Labour's vision for Hartlepool. Well, it's both. Um, but okay, what's Labour's vision for Hartlepool? That's okay. unique and different oh, yeah. and distinct. Yeah. So, I will, so the best companies come to Hartlepool to provide the best jobs because we have the best trained people. The Tories because disagree we've in, with that. Because we've invested in people right from the start of life. And you make that difference to children so by the time they start school, they, they, they're able, they're not behind their peers, they can read, um, they can, um, you then have small class sizes in, um, in, and, and really good, um, you know, my, my kids are at primary school and they say that, you know, the class sizes are large, the, the head teacher talks to me about, um, uh, have cuts in schools and having to reduce teaching assistance so you you help the most vulnerable children you help children with special educational needs and when kids are you know um um, aren't coming to school, you, you, you send out support workers to find out what's going in the household and you help people to get to a point where they can be, have really great skills, really great training and then employers come to you, not because you've got the lowest taxes, okay. because you've got the best people. There's, there's some direct things. That's but you what, don't, you, you, you don't know what, but do you, I'm genuinely interested, do you know what the Labour vision for the country is? Are well, you asking me what, uh, no, the country, the country, what's um, the Labour vision well, for the to country? Let's to, to replicate that and, and you start the best place for a child to be born and the best place to go. That sounded like he was asking why he was found in the back of a taxi with ketamine on his collar and a dildo in his hand. It seemed like that was a really hard, hostile question. He was really squirming. You asked him quite a basic question, Owen. What was going on? Was that as uncomfortable as it looked? <laughs> um, it was quite a long interview and we, we didn't include various <laughs> sections uh, where, where we asked uh, other, other questions with similar results. I should well, say he I hasn't think... been found in the back of a taxi with ketamine on his collar and a dildo. I in think for hand. reasons of libel, we need to clarify that absolutely clearly hasn't I was saying that it was like as if he was answering a question. Yeah, yeah, very good. Just to avoid a protracted uh, lawsuit and exchange of <laughs> legal letters, that, that hasn't happened. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look, I think to be generous to him, as I said earlier, to be generous to the local Labour candidate, whoever they are, they're going to struggle to articulate what Labour's vision is for a very simple and straightforward reason, which is Labour does not have a vision. They don't have any idea what they want to do with political power uh, whatsoever. And the fact is the Tories do have a clear vision. They have a vision of nationalist populism, uh, which is via their interpretation of Brexit, uh, which is wedded to strategic investment, uh, particularly in areas which are popular uh, as they see it. Um, um, health, education and police. Those are the three big things they went on in the election and targeted investment in communities that they hold or are seeking to gain. And that vision is cutting through and it is effective, particularly amongst older white homeowners in communities which are often called and lumped together and ho homogenized as the so-called Red Wall. Uh, and that's the voter coalition that they have sought and now are seeking to cement. The problem Labour have is Starmer's team uh, waltzed into that operation, it, believing that all that was needed was for the grown-ups, as they see it, to come back in the room uh, the, of politics, uh, that self-evidently they were more competent and able, I'm explaining their narrative here, by the way, uh, than their predecessors, who were self-evidently, as they see it, shambolic, um, and that they had a candidate, Keir Starmer, who didn't have baggage in the same way, 
uh, who was a knight of the realm, who had run, who'd been a prosecutor against criminals, um, and therefore he would attract back socially conservative voters in particular that Labour lost. And that has not worked at all. One of the reasons is a lot of the people around Keir Starmer, uh, they're basically on safari. They don't understand the communities they're talking about. They didn't grow up in them. They know almost nothing about them. Uh, and they're trying to caricature and cosplay uh, the sorts of uh, voters who live there through focus groups where they repeat back the messages that they get without coming up with their own clear or distinct uh, message. Um, and that come, that looks inauthentic to lots of people, the whole you know, Keir Starmer going around always a full pint, not 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 entirely convincing. Plus flags, uh, and and that's an attempt uh, as they they think if they tick those boxes, uh, that then they will attract those voters back. What they don't have, Labour did have a clear vision in 2017, which was to redistribute wealth and power from the top to everybody else, for the many, not the few. Of course, that vision then got worn down very significantly by the Brexit trauma and drama which is why in 2019 Labour didn't have a clear vision and kept chopping and changing its slogans throughout the uh, election because they didn't know how to deal with how Brexit had polarised their voter coalition. But in, in the aftermath of Brexit, um, Labour don't have that vision. Now, one of the excuses they have is the pandemic, but actually that would have been, an, a, you know, that national emergency is an, is an opportunity to showcase a vision. Uh, look at World War II. Winston Churchill should have won the 1945 election by a landslide. He was extremely popular, Winston Churchill, in 1945. But Labour crafted a vision in 1945 of once we win the war, we've got to win the peace. And we're best placed to secure that peace by addressing the injustices that have been exacerbated and exposed by the war. And that's what they could have done with the pandemic, and they didn't. And they didn't pin responsibility on the government, who then people now feel resigned as thinking, well, they could have made, done things better, that Labour would not have done a better job because they haven't offered a narrative of what they would have done better that is convincing or compelling. The problem we have now with, with the Labour leadership and the Labour vision and the Labour strategy is they're not winning back the voters Labour have lost at all. Uh, they're becoming cemented in the Tories electoral coalition, whilst at the same time, they're, you know, they're, they're, the, the, the new core vote of the Labour Party, which is disproportionately younger people who rent in precarious and insecure jobs, their reasons for feeling inspired by the Labour Party uh, are, being, uh, are being trashed. Uh, the, you know, there is no clear, coherent, inspiring vision that's speaking to them. Um, and I think the other problem is, you know, Keir Starmer stood on those 10 pledges to, secure, to safeguard the 10, to safeguard core domestic policies of the Corbyn era. They haven't spoken about them or they just violated them as they did by opposing the Tories, increasing corporation tax, quite literally from the right of the Conservatives. And that just looks shifty and dishonest. Uh, and I think what's cutting through, and it is cutting through in places like Hartlepool, is these guys don't believe in anything. They're not authentic, uh, whilst the Tories have a, a vision and they're turning on the taps. And that's why Labour are failing. They have no clear vision. They don't know what they want with power. And do you know how they're going to respond after this? The only way they know how to respond, punching left. Simon Fletcher, who is the former Chief of, Cor uh, Chief of Staff to Corbyn, who was taken on by Keir Starmer's team during the leadership election to try and uh, assuage the left, uh, he's leaving um, uh, the operation. Uh, the operation will move to the right, I think, quite self-evidently. They may do a reshuffle, which which brings in people from the right, uh, and they will uh, they they will you know they they will try and impose a narrative that a lot of their outriders and a lot of the media will uh, cement, which is in violation of the facts uh, that this is somehow on the left, and they're not uh, they're not defining themselves against the ideas and policies of the left sufficiently. And the problem is they don't have, an, you know, their cupboard is empty. It's, there's nothing in their intellectual cupboard. There is no project for European social democracy of their political iteration that is relevant to the crisis we live in, unlike the 1990s a period, a period of financialized growth and rising living standards. They don't have the answer to it. Uh, and I think what we'll see in 29, in, after this election is them doubling down, shifting to the right, um, and trying to define themselves against the left even further. And it will not work, but it won't stop them from doing it. We don't have Keir Starmer here to defend himself. I'd love him to come on the show. He's obviously not particularly interested in doing that. We do have um, in, in one moment a clip where he is quite explicitly asked to lay out his vision. Before we go to that, if you're enjoying 
this show, um, please do subscribe to the channel. We go live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. We put out videos every day, so hit that subscribe button. Um, now let's take a look at Keir Starmer having another crack at the vision thing. Here he is in conversation with Kathy Newman on Channel 4 News. Would a Prime Minister Starmer be as radical as the US President Joe Biden with his four and a half trillion dollar plan? Let me tell you what I would do. I would fix the economy. What we've had over the last 10 years, an economy which is short term, and that has led to low pay, low standards, low investment, low productivity, um, and the model is broken. Inequality is baked in, and that is morally wrong, and it's economically stupid. I would also have the ambition to go beyond the economy. Public services um, need to be looked at. We need a preventative set of public services, and we need public services that cut across uh, each other. I've, I've seen so many examples in my time of people coming through the criminal justice system who, for a bit of intervention and support, would never have been there, and their victims would never have been victims. But we also need the ambition to change the culture, because for the last 10 years, whether it's in America, uh, whether it's in the UK or across Europe, we have had this utter focus on what divides us. But am I up for the radical change that's needed to make our economy work better for everybody? You bet I am. A part of that was just sort of Keir Starmer cringe, and, it, and it's, it's, it's down to him being a bit of a technocratic politician. I suppose expressing a vision is harder when you're up against a politician quite as wily and quite as flexible as, as Boris Johnson is. Yeah, I mean, Boris Johnson is an extremely wily uh, uh, politician who, you know, he, he succeeded partly because he's not seen as a t another Tory, even though you'd think from our perspective he embodies Toryism. I, I mean, I think just quick, uh, just to see where they should get to, where they've got wrong, I think sums it up, because um, back in February, they did this big keynote speech, Keir Starmer, which was supposed to be the 21st century vision for the Labour Party, uh, which was partly as fine as far as it went. It was a diagnosis of inequality, but it was going back to the whole, you know, under Miliband, uh, bless him, you know, th that whole project was often diagnosing what was wrong, uh, cost of living crisis, promise of Britain, where the next generation have a better life than their parents, squeezed middle. They kept jumping from analysis to analysis without a policy. Their one signature policy they came up with was the British recovery bond, which has never been heard of since. And that, I think, sums it up. They're looking desperately around for a vision, anything, any sort of vision. Um, and, and they're not, you would then, what you do is you stick to that vision, you hammer away at it relentlessly, and they're not doing that. And I think they'll get stuck in a cycle of relaunches, stagnating polls, relaunches, They'll brief to the press. Another recent, Keir Starmer is resetting his leadership with a new speech. You're going to hear a lot of that. And I think the other problem is this whole Tory sleaze approach, uh, attack line, I think is I think is very misguided in lots of ways. I think part of it is trying to hark back to the 1990s because a lot of them saw that worked for New Labour quite well. A lot of that was to do with sex, by the way. I mean, there was the Neil Hamilton stuff where it was about, you know, dodgy envelopes. But a lot of that was the Tories launched a back to basics campaign of morality to return to the Victorian age. And then lots of Tory ministers were clearly having sex with anything that moved. So that that was why sleaze stuck, because sleaze is often associated with sexual issues, isn't it? And um, I think the problem with their line of attack this time round is po people are very cynical about politicians. We already know that, all the polling. I mean, politicians are less trusted than advertising executives, according to the polling. And I think the danger is with this attack line is... It feeds into a sense that all politicians are on the take. They're in it for themselves. They've got their snouts in the trough. Uh, that's what you hear over and over and over again, repeated verbatim by voters. But actually, that's just seen as spread around. That's what all politicians are like. And the more people think that, the more it actually often hurts the left. Because if you think all politicians are corrupt and in it for themselves, you don't trust them to come up with grand national projects of social reform, or, or you're less likely to. And what they should have done is stuck to an anti-elite framing. PPE contracts is about, uh, for example, being handed out to their mates. It's about an elite that looks after themselves. Uh, the fact that, you know, tests and trace failed, again, an elite that looks after themselves, handed to their private sector mates who made a an absolute pig's ear of the whole thing. Not locking down quick enough was because, again, they feared it would hit the profits of business. Human life was less important. And Labour should have done what they did under Attlee with World War II, which is to go, 
Look at what this national tragedy has done. We clapped from windows for the key workers who have been undervalued and underpaid for so long. And now we're going to give them the wages and terms and conditions, the millions of them that they deserve. And instead, we have Keir Starmer on national television who can't even commit to anything more than a two and a half percent pay rise for nurses. That the self-employed, the millions of self-employed and precarious uh, uh, workers in this country, again, with, they've been exposed one pay packet away from insecurity. That will change. Universal credit, which millions of people have been sucked into the orbit of, inadequate. We need to build a new welfare state, which is actually suits the needs of the times. And the polling has shown that people's attitudes towards the welfare state has completely and utterly changed. That we've seen from how uh, test and trace failed, private sector mess, Unlike the vaccine rollout, public sector NHS rollout, that shows public ownership works. So we're going to go down that avenue. They could have knitted that together. We're going to stand up against an elite that looks after their own by redistributing wealth and power and curing the injustices that were exposed and exacerbated by the national emergency that worked in 1945. They beat bloody Winston Churchill, the wartime leader, in a landslide. It's not the same, obviously, but there are some similarities, but they didn't do that. They were too scared to pin responsibility for the pandemic on the government. They let them get away with it. And now they're going down a line of politicians were all dodgy. That's rebounded on them. They've got the various new Labour ghosts of Christmas pass associated with them. And people just go, well, you've got that problem uh, as well. Uh, and they're not coming up with that coherent, inspiring vision. Instead, they're jumping from message to message to message, throwing occasional policy into the ether, forgetting about it. It never cuts through. It never sticks if you do that. Um, and that's their fight. That's their failure. That's their problem. And if they stuck to that clear vision, I think it would cut through but they don't have a vision they have any confidence in. So all they'll do after this is carry on down the line of, I'm not Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson, but they won't define who he actually is instead, all the leadership. And they're looking at continued stagnation and decline. This is not going to end well by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, and I think I'm afraid to say all too many of them, this whole political project of Keir Starmer seems to have been founded on a fraud because it was a case of people who voted for Liz Kendall or campaigned for her back in 2015, the Blairite candidate in 2015, signing up to a soft left agenda because they thought that was the sweet spot of the Labour membership in 2020. And I don't think they believed it. I don't think they believed it one bit. And now they're going to just throw all of that overboard and go the way of the European sister parties, which I'm afraid to say are in a far worse state than Labour Party ended even in 2019.